Hi, and welcome to this next video on OCR A-Level Biology. We're on module 2.4, which is enzymes. And in this video, we're going to be looking at cofactors and coenzymes. So in the previous video on enzymes, I talked about what enzymes are. So we discussed that they were biological catalysts, which increase the rate of, and a catalyst increases the rate of a reaction and is not used up in the reaction itself. So enzymes are pretty much very useful. They can work at any p at a neutral, most of them can work at neutral pH, at normal pressures. They can work at lower temperatures, so around 37 degrees Celsius. And they are also very specific to a particular substrate. Enzymes have an active site, which is where the substrate binds and where the reaction ha happens. When the enzyme and the substrate bind together at the enzyme's active site, this is known as the enzyme substrate complex. The active site is complementary to the substrate and it can be altered by both pH and temperature. So where enzymes, I then talked about where enzymes work. And here I discussed intracellular versus extracellular. So intracellular enzymes work inside the cell, whether that be within the cytosol or within compartments within the cell, such as the nucleus or the mitochondria or endoplasmic reticulum or chloroplast even, if it's a plant cell, so on. So for example, we have an example of glycolysis, which you will learn about in year two where glucose converts, is converted into G6P by an enzyme hexokinase. G6P is converted to F6P by an enzyme called phosphoglucose isomerase. And an enzyme called PFK converts F6P into F16BP. And this is an intracellular metabolic pathway called glycolysis. I then talked about extracellular enzymes, and those ones are outside the cell, so they work outside of the cell. So, for example, amylase converts starch or breaks down starch or carbohydrates into glucose. So now we're going to talk about cofactors. Whoops. So now we're going to talk about cofactors and coenzymes. So first up, let's talk about why we have cofactors and coenzymes. So some enzymes need help. So particular enzymes, such as those carry in catalyzing redox reactions or oxidation reduction reactions, they can only work if another small non-protein molecule is attached to them. And these small molecules are known as cofactors. So a cofactor... is a substance that is required that is required to ensure an enzyme catalyzed reaction to ensure that an enzyme catalyzed reaction occurs at the appropriate appropriate rate. So we have what are called prosthetic groups and these are part these are basic cofactors which are integrated within the enzyme structure. And some others, such as mineral ions and organic coenzymes, they form temporary associations with the enzyme. So a cofactor is a non-organic molecule. 
So cofactors, they tend to be non-organic. A coenzyme is essentially an organic and organic cofactor. So essentially what I mean by that is a cofactor can be anything which is it's usually non-organic such as a mineral iron, like a zinc or a magnesium iron. But a coenzyme is essentially a cofactor which is organic. So think something like a, um, I don't know, like NAD. NAD is a coenzyme and it's required in uh, glycolysis, which you will learn about in year two. So... It's a bit dark here. Yeah. So a cofactor, which is so a prosthetic group, group, is a con is a cofactor, which is permanently bound, permanently part of the enzyme structure. So those are our key definitions that we need. So for example, let's take uh, one example, which we'll learn about actually in module three. So we'll have, let's take C or CO2 plus H2O and this goes to and then this goes to H C H2CO3 Actually, this reaction is reversible. So I am going to delete this and then do this. Because this reaction is reversible. And this reaction can go forward and back to form. Uh, let's do H plus and HCO3 minus. You'll learn about more you learn more about this reaction in module 3, in module 3.2. But essentially, what I'm trying to get here is that this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. <clears throat> and carbonic anhydrase has a cofactor slash phosphatic group. So... There is a zinc ion which is bound to the structure of carbonic anhydrase. So let's do a zinc factor, which is permanently bound to the carbonic anhydrase to enable it to carry out its function. So if I draw the enzyme, which is easier said than done, but Say if this is the enzyme. So this is our carbonic anhydrase. The zinc ion would be somewhere around in here. So this would be our zinc ion. Otherwise known as our prosthetic group. And then this here would be our carbonic and hydrate. And you can see that this zinc ion is permanently bound to the carbonic anhydrase and that's what enables this enzyme to carry out its function. So we have 
other cofactors as well. So whereas the zinc with carbonic anhydrase is present in a compound and that is permanently bound to the enzyme's active site, so the zinc ion is permanently bound to the carbonic anhydrase at its active site. This diagram I've drawn is a bit wrong, but, but just to illustrate the point. So these Some ions are also needed for certain enzymes when they're not permanently bound, so they only temporarily bind to these enzymes and help carry out their function. So these ions which are just temporarily bind to enzymes and enable them to carry out their function, these are also called cofactors. So during an enzyme catalyzed reaction, the enzyme and substrate molecules temporarily bind together to form an ESC, an enzyme substrate complex. The presence of certain ions that may temporarily bind to either the substrate or the enzyme molecule, this may ease or aid in the formation of these enzyme substrate complexes and therefore help increase the rate of the enzyme reaction. So some factors, so cofactors, act as co-substrates. So let me give you an example, uh, a crude example. So say we have our enzyme, which is this. So this is our enzyme. And our substrate, well, our substrate is this. Actually, let's, how am I going to do this? And our substrate is this. You can see that this substrate does not fit in the side properly. So this is our substrate. But if we add in our cofactor, which will be this block here, So this is our cofactor. You can see that both the cofactor and the substrate form together to form the co-substrate, and then they can both bind to the enzyme active site and enable the, and this cofactor can help the enzyme carry out its function. It's a bit of a rubbish of a bad diagram, but at least you can see the point of a cofactor. Anyway, so yep, yeah, that's what we call a co-substrate. Some cofactors can also change the charge distribution on the surface of the substrate molecule or on the surface of the enzyme's active site. These can make the temporary bonds in the enzyme in the ESC easier to form. So for example, amylase digest starts, so if we go back to our previous example up here, with um, amylase, we can see amylase converts starch into glucose, but it will only do so if you add in some chloride ions. So chloride ions are a cofactor for amylase enzyme to be able to function. So now that's, so, now that's cofactors, now we're going to look at coenzymes. So let's let's do coenzymes in this area here. So now we're going to look at whoops. So now we're going to look at coenzymes. So coenzymes, these are small, as I said, these are small non-protein molecules. But they are still organic.
they bind temp they are temporary they are bind temporarily. So they bind temporarily to the active site of the enzyme. I'm gonna write E for enzyme from now on. So they can either do this just before or at the same time as the substrate binding. So the coenzymes are chemically changed. So they are chemically changed during the reaction and they need to be recycled back to their original state, sometimes by a different enzyme. So some vitamins are a source of coenzymes. So for example, vitamin B12 is a coenzyme derives into a coenzyme called cobalamin. Folic acid, which derives, which comes, which turns into tetrahydrofolate. Nicotinamide, vitamin B3, is used to generate NAD and NADP. NAD is used in aerobic respiration, in glycolysis. Uh, vitamin B6, or pan pantophenate, I don't know how you say that, but pantophenate or vitamin B6 is used in coenzyme A. Thiamine or B vitamin B1 is used in thiamine pyrophosphate. And deficiencies in or a lack of these vitamins cause a lack in their respective coenzymes. And this can lead this can lead to some deficiency diseases. So for example, a deficiency in vitamin B3 leads to a lack of the coenzyme NAD. And this can result in a disease called pellagra, which results in diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia. Uh, a lack in coenzyme A, which is derived from vitamin B6, can lead to elevated triglyceride levels in the blood plasma. Vitamin B12, a lack in vitamin B12, can lead to something called malicious anemia. And vitamin B1, a lack in vitamin B1, something can lead to something, a condition called uh, beriberi. That is B E R I B R I. Beriberi, which is which results in mental confusion, irregular heartbeat, muscular weakness, and all sorts of other complications. So that's it. That's for um, so NAD and NADP. So you are, these are hydrogen acceptors, and you will learn more about these during your second year of A level when you learn about respiration for NAD and photosynthesis for NADP. Anyway, that's it for this video here. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope this was somewhat useful, and we'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.